Welcome, my name is Kelly Anderson and this is Fanimated, the animation fan podcast where every week we get a chance to geek out about our favorite animated media. And that is so true for today, as Josh Palmer and I discuss my all-time favorite animated film, How to Train Your Dragon. This DreamWorks film was released on March 26, 2010 and won 10 Annie Awards, including Best Animated Feature. We have so much to discuss this episode, so buckle up for some high-flying spoilers, and let's get started and let's get animated. Hey, Josh. Hi, Kelly. (laughs) Thanks for joining me today. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to talk about my favorite animated film ever. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so honored to be talking about this with you. I, I feel... As I was thinking about this, I was a little bit intimidated because I knew that you loved, you still love How to Train Your Dragon with all of your heart. So I'm gonna just going to try to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you brought your ukulele in. I did. And you said you had a song for me. Yes, I have a song for you. I wrote a song as I was singing about How to Train Your Dragon because <laughs> it's fun and I like writing songs. Great. So. I'm excited to hear it. All right. Well, here you go. How to Train Your Dragon is quite the film fillet Full of hope and glory and even some dismay Hiccup and Deer Toothless, what a pair they make Their friendship lasts forever, invest in yours today Oh, How to Train Your Dragon is quite the film fillet Full of hope and glory and even some dismay Oh, Hiccup and Deer Toothless, what a pair they make Friendship lasts forever, invest in yours today (laughs) That is so wonderful Thank you Thank you (laughs) Thank you (laughs) I didn't write um, extra lyrics because I thought I'm just going to sing these twice. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> um, that's what so, most songwriters do, I think. Right. You know, uh, what's what's the point? I'd rather talk about the film and see how much there is to, uh, to learn anyway. So. Well, that is so fun. Thank you. Thank you. When was the first time you watched this film? Oh, that is a great question. I remember it exactly the first time. Um, I was in 10th grade. Mm-hmm. I was uh, in my AP U.S. History class, mm-hmm. and... It was the end of the year, and as a celebration for passing the AP history test, (laughs) we watched How to Train Your Dragon, because it had just come out um, on DVD, I think. I didn't get to see it in the theater. And so we we put it on the screen in the classroom, and it was like watching it in the theater. Right, because it's big. Yeah, it's real big, Mm -hmm. and like you're we turn all the lights off, and I'm Mm -hmm. with like all my friends. And so it was actually like probably better than seeing it in the theater, Mm -hmm. because we were all there together right. and uh, I'll never forget that because it was, it was just so fun and yeah. I loved it. it was such a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a good movie. Uh, did you have to like split it up since it was during a class time or did you get to watch the entire film in one go? Uh, we watched the whole thing in wow. one go. Wow, that's good. Um, yeah. Because I know that's always a bummer when you're in class and you have can only watch like a half an hour of it and then the next day you watch another half yeah. hour of it. I think, it, I think I'm, I can't quite remember if it was because it was an AP class, it was like longer or if we had, I think we may have met like, uh, during dur- like, lunch or something. Yeah, during lunch. Mm-hmm. Like we, we, we kept it going from fourth period into lunch or something like that. I don't really remember exactly why, but I know we yeah. watched the whole thing. That's awesome. Uh, do you remember the first time you watched it? I definitely do. Okay. So when it was, um, before it came out in theaters, Um, I was very excited about it already because I had seen all the trailers and I was like, ah, (laughs) (laughs) and this was before my time as invested in the internet. So I wasn't involved in it that way as I am now with new films. I'm very much like researching it and following all the comic con and things and all the different conventions and, um, doing all that. But with this film, I did see all the trailers. And whenever a trailer came on on the TV, I was like, everyone be quiet. (laughs) 
<laughs> everyone in the house just needs a shush for a second. And um, so I was very excited about it, especially because um, it actually came out on my 16th birthday. Oh, okay. And I'm very proud of that fact. <laughs> <laughs> Even Sweet though sixteen, <laughs> yes, I was sixteen when it came out, and so I went to see it, and I dra- drug my family with me, <laughs> as I still do. I drag them to these films, and they're like, "What?" <laughs> um, and How to Train Your Dragon not only is a really great film, I don't love it only just because it's a great film, though. Like it's also timing and nostalgic for me because um, at sixteen I was still very self-conscious and there are still moments that where I am of my love for animation. Hmm. And yeah. so I was so incredibly excited for this film, but I felt very odd about it. Cause I'm like, I was like, I'm 16. I, I shouldn't want to watch all these kids movies. <laughs> and I'm like, girl, just wait till you're 24. You're yeah. still going to be excited. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to be excited for the rest of my life about these films. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was still really struggling with that at that point. And How to Train Your Dragon, when we went to go see it in theaters, man, I was so emotional about it. For me, that was the first time I'd had that um, sense of consequence and reality in the oh. situation. Okay. Um, and there definitely had been like consequences in stories before, of course. Oh, like yeah. There's always a consequence to things. But for whatever reason, this one really, really, really hit me. Um because jumping way ahead, spoilers, Hiccup loses his leg. <laughs> and Surprise. I mean, the whole film was beautiful. And I think every teenager can relate to feeling out of place and doesn't quite fit in, you know. So I really, really connected with Hiccup and immediately. And I always continued to relate to Hiccup, like in the second one he's dealing with new responsibilities and I was in college and I was, you know, dealing with that (laughs) looming threat of responsibility. And so I'm very excited for the third one too, because I really felt like I've grown up with these characters because they are also 15 and 16 in the first one. Mm -hmm. And then like move on to the, you know, early twenties and, um, yeah, now we're adults and we get to see the third one. Are we though? I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) That's a good question. It's going to be interesting to see, Uh, you know, the third one and what is going to happen uh, in that perspective. Because you're totally right. Like, they have been writing these uh, for us as our age group as we're growing up. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be interesting to see what points they hit on that are, are universal for our age. Yeah. Uh, or at least what they think is universal. Because I, I, that's what I'm really interested about for that next mm-hmm. one is... What are they going to talk about that I'm, I know that I'm going to be like, oh, crap, that's me. <laughs> yes, I feel like, yeah, yeah, they're very relatable films. So you, you were really interested in seeing this when you were 16. Mm-hmm. What was it about, like, a trailer or something that mm. you saw that you were like, I'm interested in this? Like, because you sound yeah. like you were really pumped even before you saw it. So why? What was it about it? That's an excellent question. I really enjoy stories that are about father-son relationships. Oh, okay. Interesting. And that coming-of-age story is just something that I've always been drawn to. I really love that in most films and TVs and shows and books that I read. Um, But yeah, there's always something about that tension in the father-son relationship. And I don't know if that's necessarily what got me interested when I was watching the trailers or if it was just... The dragons. Just dragons. <laughs> That's what it was for me. Like, I'll be honest and say I just loved dragons. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, I'm going to watch this. Yeah. I like dragons. So. Um, and I was an animation fan. Right. Even then, like my whole life. So I was like, here's something new and something mm-hmm. exciting. And um, I mean, 2010 was a really good year because <laughs> we got Tangled. Oh, that was the same year. Yeah, yeah, Tangled was also 2010. So I don't know. I guess I was just on a, a just like on a high. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I just was excited about it, and I, it looked good. And you know, I think you know, probably Toothless looked cool as crap. And like, <laughs> yeah, yep, still does. It's so uh, cute too. Oh, Toothless is adorable. <laughs> ah, <laughs> Toothless. So going into the film, yeah. the very first scene 
Let Lay me... the land, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> if only you people could see what Kelly is doing right now. She she sways her hands out and says, the first scene of the film. <laughs> All right, uh, like, what is it? <laughs> okay, well, first off, the beginning, the opening narration and the ending nar- narration it's done so well. I really like yeah. that tie. Oh, it's totally, it's a nice, like, bookend. Perfect bookends. Yeah. Another thing about just the opening shot, to keep in mind, um, there are two stone figures of Vikings. One of them, his helmet, and I'm just going to be saying random, like, tidbits throughout this, yeah. but um, his helmet, one of the horns is, like, cut off. That's a tribute to the book, How to Train a Dragon, mm-hmm. um, that the film is based on. Because Hiccup's um, helmet is like that. It has one that's cut off. <clears throat> so when you're watching the films, especially the second one, keep in mind, that stone figure is representative of Hiccup, and the other one is representative of Stoic. Hmm. Just a little right. tidbit. Wow, I never got that. Yep. Well, here's another tidbit for you, Kelly Anderson. Okay, hey, Josh. I'm fairly certain that the, the word burk uh, comes from an old English term that basically means uh, a, a land where people don't know anything. It's like people, they don't have oh. a land. Like this, these, huh. it's, it is a, it's, it was a term that was kind of derogatory for people who were homeless. They did not have a place to be and they were foolish. And it was like, that's kind of the connotations that it, it comes huh. with, which I found to be really interesting. Yeah. Uh, just as a, as a world building tool because these people don't like, they are building their own home and like the whole arc of the film is like, crafting this new home both for the people and for the dragons yes wow that's so lovely mm-hmm. thank you i did my research yeah you did <laughs> <laughs> uh, um but yeah they do they do such a good job of laying out this is burke these are our characters like the that beginning sequence is so well done and you immediately get like uh hiccup's character and the way he reacts with things his sass yeah. Like, it's so great. <laughs> I just, more of the sass, please. Um, <laughs> I love the way they introduce the characters as he's narrating, too. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, you know, you don't find out that Stoic is his father until, like, yeah. that perfect moment. Mm-hmm. When everything is going horribly wrong. Yeah, <laughs> like, the writing of that is just, everything is so timed so well. Yes. And that's, I think, overall, one of the things I was, I was always the most impressed with is every single line has a payoff later in the movie. Yes. This story is so tight. Mm-hmm. It's so well done. It's like they really took their time. They they cut, they shaved, and created this perfect molding of this story. And I really, really appreciate how rock solid everything is. Yeah. Yeah, and just how they, they introduced the kids, the other kids, and Astrid. It's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> just like coming exploding with, with their hair her. yeah oh. <laughs> and like oh their job is so much cooler and but like he has his job in the um forge and mm-hmm. um gobber is so great like you can tell that hiccup was just kind of like given to gobber all the time because stoic was busy right being a chief and gobber i think is a second father figure for him mm-hmm. yeah I, personally i think hiccup's job is cooler <laughs> like, <laughs> like building stuff yeah, in the forge. Yeah. yeah like that sounds cooler to me than going out and carrying buckets of water all the time yeah i really like that inventive spirit that he has and like he's very smart and so um and he just is trying so hard at the beginning to be like everyone else and the introdu- introduction to all the different types of dragons too oh, and yeah. then of course when night fury comes right. and it's like <laughs> Night Fury, get down! Get down! <laughs> and they say it like throughout the whole thing, even yeah. even like at the at very, very end. end. Night Fury, get down! And then <laughs> she jumps on them. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's such a good moment. It's so great. Yeah, and then Hiccup messes everything up, and it's like, okay, but but I got a Night Fury. Like <laughs> no one believes they him. They don't care. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and how? Um, yeah, Hic- Hiccup is just so snarky and sarcastic, and is, you know, talking to Gobber about the, you know, like, he's imitating his father, like, this year, this is a talking fish boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, from the beginning, it's just really set out that the village um, knows Hiccup is a Hiccup, mm-hmm. is a, you know, messes everything up, and um, Stoic is frustrated with that, too, and yeah. and Hiccup knows it. Like, Hiccup knows whatever everyone thinks of him and like that just must be so hard but he tries so hard like he wants he's trying so hard to fit in so he's doing what he can to like do that to catch 
or kill a dragon. And right. um, yeah, so he has uh, a you, lot of issues. He does. You know, it's something that has always been curious to me is literally his name, Hiccup. Mm-hmm. Do, do, do you know much more about why they chose Hiccup as his name? It, it is Hiccup in the books. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the movie they're talking about, you know, ugly names, like yeah. Scarf Trolls and whatever, whatever. Uh, I don't know why Hiccup specifically at this point. One of my favorite bloggers on Tumblr um, that has been very adamant in the How to Train Your Dragon fandom for a while. The blog name is... D Y A N N E H S dot Tumblr dot com. So Diane is. Mm-hmm. Anyway, <laughs> she is a professional archaeologist and oh. is um, a specialist in medieval textiles. Ooh. And she's a How to Train Your Dragon fan. Well, that's a nice pair. <laughs> it is. So she has a lot of really great blogs, and they're very. Um, it's easy to understand. She's yeah, okay. she is she's just it's accessible. Cas- she's accessible. It's casual. It's fun, and she's explaining, uh, you know, Viking culture and mythology and all these things. And she has this whole um, article, for lack of a better word, about names. And they really did have like these naming rituals, and they took names very seriously for mm. different reasons than the book and movies. Um, they actually, they weren't thinking of weird names to like scare off gnomes and trolls, but they were, <laughs> <laughs> they took their naming of children very seriously because, you know, they want to place a name on someone. They just mean a lot and putting a name on someone that they hope they will become like that name means or, hmm. or whatnot. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And I, I would love to learn more about that because I feel like uh, n- nowadays our, our, interpretation of the word hiccup is so different so yes uh, so it takes a little bit of digging for someone to find out you know why that and why not you know does it have the double connotation on purpose of like he's literally a hiccup in right. the bubble of their <laughs> culture or or what um yeah it's just interesting mm-hmm. and here i did take a piece of what she says in that blog uh, she said, um, names held significance. Children could be named for ancestors to invoke the protection of that person who had passed. Children might be named for mythology. Children might be named for desirable traits or certain blessing. Astrid means beloved of the gods. So parents who named their daughters Astrid were probably hoping for just that. Um, names were powerful and they were chosen with great care after the birth to ensure that it was best, the best name for the baby. Um, there was spirituality to it, ancestral and religious respect to it, personal significance to it. No parent would name their child something because they just liked it. They considered um, all of that in the naming process. And there's like a naming ritual and they didn't name the children until like nine days, like after they were born, like Ooh. all these other things. I, and then for those first eight days, they're just calling it baby. And I suppose. So every time they have like triplets, there's mm-hmm. like, this is baby one, baby two, baby <laughs> three. We're not ready yet to call them names, but... <laughs> <laughs> right, right. This is just... Man, could you... Oh, man, I cannot imagine if a poor woman had triplets at that time. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Terrible. Uh, yeah. And, like, the, the the mother had to have it have the child in the home, and so about a month before the baby was due, neither the mother or the father would leave um, the area surrounding their house. Mm. So they wouldn't go off and do anything because the father had to be in the room. When the baby was being born. Oh, for like spiritual reasons or? Yeah. It was kind of like the baby doesn't become a human with human rights until like, unless the dad is there and huh. they can bless it or something. Wow. Yeah. Weird. And yeah. so cool. And so cool. It's so, oh it's like, and it's also cool because it's like, you no, know, the dad can't just like wait in the other room. It's like the dad is there. Mm-hmm. And I think that's cool. That is cool. I mean, it's nice to be a part of that. That's yeah. not something that's super common nowadays. No, so. not necessarily. Yeah. It's more like all the guys leave. Anyway, we're getting... Uh, oh, yeah. But, you know, it's super cool to learn about that the culture of everything. And um, the films do a really good job of actually... I mean, not, obviously not... I mean, dragons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dragons. Besides that part. Everything else is so uh, accurate. <laughs> uh, yeah, and not everything. You know, yeah. like their, their hair and their beards would not be that long and braided and right. weird. But... Um, it's more fun that way. It is. Um, but even little things, because she is a textile expert, like, even specifically in the second movie, Astrid's shirt, it blows my mind what we can do with uh, 3D animation right now, but you zoom in, the way that the fabric is even woven, 
No way. Yes. Seriously? <laughs> Seriously. The way that it is woven, the fabric is woven, is the is the tie is the way they used to do it. What the heck? <laughs> That's detail. It's so detailed wow. and so amazingly cool. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's great. Guys, I love animation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh man, to I be just, doing that sort of research while you're doing and the t- the tiny zooming in of making that. Oh, woof. That just blows my mind. It blows my mind too and I love it. What else did this woman say? About, about culture? The, yeah, about like did they have other connections to the, like the armor or like cuz I always noted their their armor seemed yeah. very their uh, armor appropriate. Is- their armor is very stylized. It mm-hmm. was not like that. She has. She actually has a picture because she was working on a breastplate. <laughs> um, and th- it's basically just a sheet of metal. Like, mm. very small. I don't know sizes. Like a, a, <laughs> but it a did chest not, square. <laughs> it didn't even cover the entire chest. It mm. was kind of like, you might have two or you might just have one. They were like just strapped on. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like a knight. Mm-hmm. You know, you think of a knight and it's like completely covers the torso. Right, yeah. It was just like a sheet of metal that's thrown in front of your chest because she has a lot of good articles on um, medicine and a really good mm-hmm. one about amputation. Ooh. And she goes through exactly like how it would have happened like after the battle with the Red Death. Yeah. Um, what they would have done to ensure that he survived Mm -hmm. the shock and everything. Very fascinating. But she has one, uh, she just mentions that like they're, they were pretty good at dealing with stomach wounds. But if you were in that time period and you were, uh, pierced or hit with in the chest, you were basically dead. Hmm. They just didn't have a good way of dealing with it. Um, so that's why, breastplates were much more important. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because that was the area that they, they just didn't, didn't could, know. Couldn't protect, yeah. Yeah. So that's one definitely like super interesting thing that I thought. Was yeah. Cool. I was every time I watch it, I notice how Gobber, who's got what like 12 or 14 different hand things Yeah, of yeah, he does. Thing. He has like a ton. Um he if you look on his arm, it's like attached with like a rope that goes uh, a little bit yeah. further down. So like it's on there it's and it's like, I don't know, twisted on there or something. But then if you look a little bit up the arm, there's a rope that goes around it that mm. it's just like holding it on. Yeah. And then later when you, when Hiccup gets his leg put on and you see the, the like metal piece for the mm-hmm. first time, um, there's a rope of uh, exactly the same distance and style, clearly mm. done by Gobber, that's, like, just above where his, like, you can see the skin of his leg. Yeah, wow. Um, and I always thought that was interesting because in my head it was like, oh, really? That whole amputated le- leg or arm is held on by that little rope? I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> but I think there's so much more to it than that. Like, mm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm sure, did, does the woman have anything about that? She didn't talk about prosthetics. Okay. She just talked about the medical, like, how to keep someone alive. Right. I and suppose that's probably more stylized anyway. R- yes. Oh, yeah. The, the prosthetics and things. I mean, I'm sure they would have had some sort of thing. You know, like peg, peg legs. legs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely um, hiccup. Hiccup's um, own version of his leg is definitely probably not historically accurate at no, all. I, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> we don't care because they are dragons. You're right. <laughs> um, but when they are his, like culturally accurate with things, it is really, really satisfying. Yeah, that is super cool. So Hiccup and Toothless. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just love all the relationships in these films. But let's just talk about Hiccup and Toothless for a second because okay. that's kind of like the point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, I mean, we're all familiar with this kind of story of, like, you know, change the perspective of the of the group and everything is better and mm-hmm. let's not fight and nature is great. Um, it's almost like a Romeo and Juliet type of story, basically, because it's like the two sides pitted against each other. Huh. I would not have thought of it like that. Okay. Yeah. Expand on that. Oh, well... Because you have, you know, dragons, humans, Vikings, um, Montague's Capulets, they're okay. fighting, mm-hmm. and there's not a whole lot of sense to it. 
I mean, you know, the dragons do. They what fight because they, they fight. They fight. They fight. Mm-hmm. Basically, and you know, Stoic is like, mm-hmm. yeah. You, you know, they've killed hundreds of us, and Hiccup's like, they we've killed thousands of them, and mm-hmm. all these things. And so I guess I say Romeo and Juliet because in my mind it makes sense that it's like, you know, the two people from the two groups coming together yeah. to resolve the conflict. Totally. Okay. Yeah, I see that. You're right. Oh, that's cool. It, it, coming together, you know, knowing that they shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Because I think, you know, obviously we get this from Hiccup's perspective, but Toothless knows that this is bad too. Like, yeah. E- so that brings up a question for me, and mm-hmm. I want to ask this before you continue. Yes. Um, we obviously know that Toothless is very intelligent. Yes. Um, and we know that he can communicate in a variety of different ways. Mm-hmm. You think he has independent thought and, like, can, like, come up with those sort of thoughts on his own and then like have opinions on things and stuff like that? I think Toothless, that's a wonderful question, by the way. I think Toothless is first and foremost an animal. Mm -hmm. He, if anything, he understands Hiccup really well and reacts to Hiccup in very human ways. So perhaps it's like, uh, a dolphin who has a high degree of intelligence and can communicate in humans in a special sort of way. Hiccup has that sort of connection, but also sort of like a like a pet might know a human, like a cat or a dog would know a human. Like they yeah. have that sort of in like instinctual connection. Yes. Um. So it's more like a amalgamation of animal instincts, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, I wouldn't say this is like a cartoon where animals have full thought, or mm-hmm. you know, because you know they're not talking. I will say in the books. Toothless does talk. Oh. And Hiccup and Toothless do talk to each other. Okay. Hiccup is the, the kind of the first to understand dragon language. Yeah, I remember reading about that. So, yeah. But that never really translates in the, the films. Net, that doesn't. But they definitely, I mean, they have to have some of that interaction so that you really get a feel for Hiccup and Toothless's relationship and how it grows. Um, side note, Toothless in the books is amazing. <laughs> and in the books, Toothless is the sassy one. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, and has so much crap. And he is like, I'm the best. <laughs> and like, he's this tiny little dragon. Yeah, I heard he's very small. He's very small and has a ton of sass. Huh. And it's brilliant. And like, he just wants things all the time and Hiccup. <sighs> Poor Hiccup. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. Um, All right, so we're getting back to the relationship between the two of them in the film. Yes. Yeah, I just really love how it grows. And Josh, we've talked about this before. I really, really enjoy stories that um, can say a lot without a lot of dialogue. Yeah. So like Spirit, DreamWorks Spirit is another like really good example. I really love that film because there's not a ton of dialogue narration. And in this film, the Forbidden Friendship scenes and the see you tomorrow scenes, they're saying all of these things without any words. Mm. And I love that. And that's how, that's how this relationship is presented to us is in that way of just getting to see it build. And we don't even, because you know, the dragons can't talk in the film. And, um, I am really happy by the way, with how they changed the story for film. Um, because it is very, very, very different from the book, but I'm happy with how it turns out. Mm. And, and I think, you know, dragon speaking in a book makes a lot of sense um, because you can't see their reaction as much. Like, yes. you can describe it as much as you want and you can, you know, use words to, to describe it. But in seeing it in a film, it just goes a lot faster. Because it's visual. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just different mediums. And so, of course, they did it. And they did they did it really well. And I would say Chris Sanders and Dean De Debu- <sighs> French, I'm... De I, Blois. It's De Blois. De Blois. De Blois. Okay. De Blois. We'll call them Chris and Dean. Okay. <laughs> um, they came from uh, right out of Lilo and Stitch. Right. So I think there's definitely... Uh, I, I see a lot of Stitch in Toothless. Yeah, it's in his face. Mm-hmm. Seeing some of his like bone structure even a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And, and just a... Uh, yeah. The way their ears work, you know, mm-hmm. and, and yeah. really uh, emotion. And um, so Forbidden Friendship is one of my favorite scenes. Um, <laughs> Let's remind everybody what's what part of yes. that is. Okay, so I 
I will be talking about scenes based on the titles of the soundtrack <laughs> names. <laughs> Because you love the soundtrack like more than anything else in the world and have it constantly running. Yeah. <laughs> I've been constantly listening to the How to Train to Train soundtrack since 2010. Um, because I, again, I had just turned 16. So what was in my car all through high school? How to Train Your Dragon. <laughs> of course. Okay. Uh, so um, I still listen to the soundtracks all the time. It's my go-to listening in the car, especially. It's just yeah. what I listen to. Yeah. Um, so yes, I'll be... Um, the music, uh, obviously, uh, this movie could not have worked if the music had not been so beautiful. No, I, I agree. I've listened to the soundtrack myself many times. Um, I have, <laughs> I had a coworker who played it in his office, like on repeat mm-hmm. for a long time. Yeah. Um, like especially around when the trailers would be released. <laughs> um, and so it would, I, I'm quite familiar with the music as well. Yes. So Forbidden Friendship mm-hmm. is when Hiccup... Even that he decides to, like, not kill him in the first place and let him free, and then decides to go back and, like, find out more. Mm. It's a very curious curious hiccup. So uh, Forbidden Friendship is when Hiccup finally comes with the fish to um, feed it to Toothless and try and um, interact with him. So... Um, it's that whole bit where with the fish and Hiccup has to eat the fish and it's super gross and funny. And, um, so there's this whole montage of Hiccup trying to, basically trying to touch Toothless, like, um, and, uh, Toothless is always like skirting away from it because, you know, Toothless has been in the battles too. Like he knows what humans do. Yeah, he knows. Um, and I love, by the way, how cat-like Toothless is. (laughs) And in this scene, you really get a lot of that, um. How he, how he reacts. And then, of course, the scene ends with Hiccup drying in the dirt and Toothless drying weird <laughs> squiggles, too, in his building. And um, he kind of leads Hiccup to Toothless and the final... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the hand thing! Yeah. The hand thing! Oh, so good. <laughs> um, where, you know... Toothless finally lets pick up. Yeah. Touch oh, it's so good. And that little hesitation that Toothless has mm-hmm. right before was an animation error, and they kept it. <laughs> ah! Because <laughs> they were like, "That looks great. Let's keep that." It, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh, I it's mean, oh, so good. That's like a the definition of a golden golden mistake. Yes, because <laughs> it's it's like the scene of the movie is. That mm-hmm. that image is the movie. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like it's it's on the it's on the book you got over there yes! too. <laughs> I have the uh, How to Train a Dragon art book. Highly recommend um, with all the beautiful concept art and the front cover. It half of it is dark and it toothless is coming out of the darkness. And on the other half, Hiccup is sitting in the light and Hiccup's reaching out with his hand for. Toothless to come. Oh, so to dramatic. Him. It's so dramatic, but it tells the story. It really does. It's the two sides yeah. and the Romeo and Juliet characters. Yeah, and it's got the like. There's a lot of fear as well as like courage, mm-hmm. and uh, in the in the picture itself, which is translated through the whole film. So yeah, yeah I love that. It's a beautiful cover. It's a beautiful book. I love all the ones they use at the end of the film in the credits. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying to find a name. The guy who did all those. Um, Nico Marlet. Nico Marlet is the artist who drew all the dragons. Who, like, has all of those concept artwork that, yeah, that's, like, at the credits and all of that. That's what it looks like. Wow. Yep, Nico Marlet. He did all of those. All of those. This one. Oh, my goodness. That's a lot of dragons to be drawing. I mean, how many is that? Like, like, oh, tons. tons, It's, like, more than 20. The thing with art books, too, is they're so small. (laughs) And it's, like less than 1% of the art that is made right. for films. Mm-hmm. That, this is why, okay, I have a joke with my friends that I want to be, I want to be the DreamWorks hobo because I just want to sit there and like look at all of the stuff they make because they make all of this art and not, like no one sees it. Hmm. <laughs> you oh, know? I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like concept art and that gets thrown yeah. away or you know, yeah. drafted and archived. And yes, like the amount of artwork that goes into any animated film is insane. Yeah. And like you've got all your storyboards, all the storyboards that were scrapped and all the like concept art and all of the character designs and Oof. it's insane and I love it and I just want to 
I just want to look at all of it. <laughs> There's Kelly sitting like next to the trash can, waiting for the, her next delivery of yeah. tossed out storyboards. <laughs> That's exactly what I want. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> nobody yeah. dreams to be a hobo except you, Kelly. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, when the hiccup. Okay, even that he like goes out of his way and makes the tail for hiccup. Uh, for Toothless, and the scene, the shot where he is put, strapping it on to mm-hmm. Toothless, and Toothless isn't quite sure about Hiccup yet, you know? And so so Hiccup is there, and I just love that that feeling you get when the wings start coming out. Oh, yeah, the anticipation builds. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and then, boom, they're off, and Hiccup's like, what? It works! And yeah, I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, I'm yeah. on a dragon. And, you know, uh, Toothless tries to fling him off, but it doesn't work without mm-hmm. him. Um, which, by the way, um, Hiccup, in Gift of the Night Fury, the Christmas special, hmm. Hiccup does create a tale that works without him having to ride Toothless. Oh, really? Yes. Very well done. Christmas movie. It, it's Snoggle Tog. Snoggle Tog. That's, the, like, their <laughs> That's holiday? their holiday. Oh, my gosh, of course. <laughs> Snoggle talk. They all have all of their own Viking traditions. Okay. And it's a great. Happy snoggle talk, gobber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, Astrid tries to make um, yak nog, like eggnog. Oh, like except- eggnog. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 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 And it, it's so funny. Um, anyway. <laughs> that, that just goes to show, like, how much How to Train Your Dragon has inspired, though, because, like, they let's talk about this really quick. That like how much material has developed because of the after the first film, you know, like yes. they they are on the third of the actual like series, mm-hmm. but they made that whole TV series two different TV two series. yeah the animated like the cartoon two dimensional one because there's Riders of Burke, Defenders of Burke, is Race to the Edge. That's the Something one that different. I was, that's the one I was watching. <laughs> Race to the Edge is the one on Netflix. Because they had an had a series on Cartoon Network after the first film. Oh. That was uh, computer animated? Yep, they're all computer animated. Race to the Edge on Netflix is like right before the second film, like time wise, although it was made after during and after. And then the other stuff was made a- after the first film. Because there's a pretty big gap in between the first film and the second film being made, um, obviously. Um, so they were making all those TV shows. And Dean did not have anything to say about the TV shows. So a lot of people don't consider them canon. But they could be considered canon because nothing major happens that wouldn't make sense with the films. And... They're not the best, mm-hmm. just going to be honest. But they are really, I really like them because I'm so, I love the characters so much. And I nannied some kids who really loved watching them, so they do ah. a good job. Mm-hmm. Um, they seem to really be a little bit more targeted at uh, the younger uh, younger audience. Yeah, yes. So. They definitely are. And I think they're, a, it's a really good show for younger kids, for sure. They definitely have some good um, Hickstrid Hiccup Astrid moments. And they also have, <laughs> after the second, <laughs> they're, my, they're my OTP. <laughs> um, one, two, par- true pairing. And they also have some good stoic hiccup stuff because after the second film came out, even before it came out, they were definitely on Race to the Edge pushing some of that, like, hiccup needs to be more responsible. Stoic is trying to get hiccup to be more like a chief, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the, yeah, so the, there's just a whole lot of material out there that's come out of this franchise. The comics, Dean did work on the comics. Mm -hmm. Um, And basically I've been freaking out because I really wanted to read them because it came out after the second film, at least these current ones. So you kind of get that first glimpse into Hiccup being a chief, which is super cool. And I really liked it. And just how he interacts with Astrid and his mom Anyway, yeah, this franchise just has a ton of material. But ultimately, you get the story with the, the films. Right. And that's all you need if that's right. all you want, for sure. Uh, How to Train Your Dragon, again, it just has that connection with me because it was the, kind of the first film I really dived into as being in a fandom online. Oh, okay. So that hence why you've got such a personal connection to it. Mm-hmm. After doing that, uh, it would... It would 
remained something really powerful for you. Yes. It, in many ways, like it, it just has that connection with me. And that's one of them because yeah, it was also the first time that I actually was like, how do they do this? Who, what, how? <laughs> and it was the first time that I was like, oh, and, People actually do this as a job. <laughs> <laughs> this this doesn't just appear. Right. Nobody just took a camera over to the animated island off the coast of the United Kingdom and like <laughs> rewind the clock. <laughs> right. You're right. Uh, but yeah, so it was also the first time that I um, would actually look at the credits and be like, "These people made this. Mm. Like this was th- this was made by." That's your future. <laughs> 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 I, I, I want it to be. Um, but yeah, and so, I mean, as a kid in a small town in the Midwest, I, you know, did a basic Google search and, and immediately went, I could never do this because mm. I was like, oh, you have to go to California. Yeah. Oh, you have to, like, send in all... Because for, like, the big schools, you, uh, for most schools, you have to send in all of your artwork. And I was like, I don't have anything like this. Like, oh, this is something that would be really cool. But I immediately shut it down because I was like, I can't do any of that. For all those people out there who want to go to animation school, there are so many really wonderful schools that will get you where you want to be right here in the Midwest. And they're everywhere. Wherever you are, you can find one. Okay, well, like what? Like what? MCAD here in Twin Cities. Minneapolis College of Art and Design? Yes. It has an animation program. Even in Iowa, where I grew up, um, DMAC, Des Moines Area Community College, has a two-year program that can get you started. And they have uh, people graduate from that program who work at Pixar right now. It doesn't matter where you come from. Like, you can do it. And Or if moving to L.A. is something you want to do, like, go for it. Because that's where you're going to, like, get a lot of connections. And there are even a ton of animation studios here in the Twin Cities. Like, Gasket and uh, Foreign Fauna and... Mm-hmm. Um, Pixel Farm. Pixel Farm. Like, people doing not only commercial work, but also telling stories. So, I mean, ultimately, guys, commercial work is also telling stories. Yeah. <laughs> so you get... You, you can do what you want to do wherever mm-hmm. you are. Right. So don't let that stop you past Kelly Oof. and all the other little kids out there. <laughs> and, or young wow. adults. I'm so inspired now, Kelly. Okay. There's oh. like a flag waving behind you. <laughs> <laughs> As I speak. I just do. I just don't want anyone else to have that experience of you can't do that because you don't know enough. Like, find people. Like, do more Obviously, do more research than I did at 16. Like, there are places you can go. And highly recommend um, a podcast called The Animated Journey. Mm. There are these people out out west. They interview animation professionals in so many different um, departments and different studios. And they just tell their story. And so if you want to get inspired and if you want to hear that your story can happen too, listen to their stories because they come from everywhere. Every country, every state, like, every background. If you can't get to art school, it's okay. Like, there are people who do this for a living that didn't go to art school. There are people, you know, so many, there are so many paths to get there. So, just don't stop. (laughs) (laughs) Keep being excited about animation, and you can do it. I believe in you. I believe in you, Kelly. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Wow. So, it's really clear why... Uh, how to train a dragon is so important to you now. Like uh, it, it sent you on that journey. Basically, it was the impetus to cause you to to learn all of those things. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was that that catalyst for me. Of this is a career. This is something that people do. This is this is an industry yeah. that they need people working in. And it was and even though it took me a long time to get to a point where I was like right now and much more serious about my art. Um, it took me years to get Mm -hmm. to the point of actually taking my art seriously, but it started it. And for me, that's just my story. Yeah. And that, and you know, and that's okay. Like that's also something that having to deal with for me of like, I've spent years pursuing other things, but that's not bad because I've grown and I understand story in a different way than I would have otherwise. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, again, can't emphasize it enough. Everyone has a different story. Right. And, um, well, like we've talked about before, Kelly, uh, y- you just got to focus on the skill set that you have and that, like, or, and that you want and like that you're trying to build. 
you know, like that's, that's what you got right now mm-hmm. and uh, start there and keep building on top of that. And, and you just hope that someday that can lead you to somewhere. And, and you can also be really fulfilled in doing that, you know, yeah. like just making the work that you have, making your own work now, uh, mm-hmm. however you can, that really makes you satisfied and fulfilled. Like that's, that's m- more important than like just sitting there hoping that someday, you know, yeah. you'll, you'll make it somewhere because you'll make it where you are. You, mm-hmm. you, somebody told me the other day, um, for such a time as this was a phrase that they like take with them all the time. And mm. I think that that's relevant here too, because, uh, you are here in this place that you are at now for such a time as this, like yes. you are meant to be here during this time. And so focus on that, build that up and continue to like refine it until you can um, use it uh, for such a time as that, <laughs> you know, yeah. like that time will come, uh, but you'll be, you won't be doing it for that time. You'll be doing it for this time, you know, the time yes. that you're in. Um, Cause we're, we are four dimensional beings. We don't exist outside of time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can only operate within that. And, and I think that's, that's really cool to, to hear, you know, you doing that uh and i'm i'm just honored to be next to you as you do that so <laughs> oh thank you josh <sighs> yes <sighs> dragons dragons Man. and it all starts with dragons <laughs> <laughs> wow that's yeah okay how about how about this i'm going to talk about why dragons are cool <laughs> particularly in this film um because this is something that like i said at the beginning i watched it first because i was like i think dragons are sweet i played how to trade you dra- or no <laughs> i played dungeons and dragons with my friends when i was in high school and i did a lot of fantasy games i played like playstation games legend of dragoon and like all these other dragon games and i just cool. loved them um and the thing that How to Train Your Dragon really brought to life for me was that dragons were more than just, like, a lizard that got big and could breathe fire and had mm-hmm. wings. They mm-hmm. all had different personalities. They all yeah. were inspired by, like, real animals. And so yes. you could see it in their behavior that it was, like, Toothless uh, is clearly inspired by, like, a cat, a dog, a horse, uh, and, like, a salamander, and, like, <laughs> all these different animals put together. Yeah. And that's so real, it's something that we can relate to because we've seen those animals, we've touched mm-hmm. them, and that it makes them more uh, more alive. And I think, for yeah. me, that was really special because I had cats and dogs growing up, and it was, it was fun uh, to, you know, have a pet, but it mm-hmm. was never, like, a... a com- uh, a comrade or, you know, mm. my, my buddy, that was this animal, but to, to, to relate to someone in such a way that they, you know, you have this instinctual, um, relationship that you're relying on each other is, was so, um, life giving to me because I think when you're in high school, it, it's so complex. Cause you're mm-hmm. like, Oh, all my relationships are all annoying. <laughs> and like, I, they're so difficult to handle because yeah. I don't understand like, why are these people behaving that way? Why do they talk like this? And you're like figuring that out. Uh, and an animal relationship can be, you know, so comforting. And I think that's for me, what, what made me really love it is because I was in a, a place where my friendships were kind of broken. And so I didn't, I didn't have a lot of friends that I could watch this movie with or that Mm -hmm. I could, you know, enjoy life with. Um, but, uh, at that time when it came out, at least. Yeah, I just, I loved that, th- that the dragons were so inspired by things that were real and weren't just, like, fantasy creatures anymore that were just mm-hmm. big and scary and dragon heart or brave heart or whatever that's called. <laughs> you know, where they're just, they're, or, or uh, Aragon. I read, did you read Aragon? Oh, I loved the Aragon yes, books. Yes, I loved those too. I read all of those with uh, one of my other friends in high school. The movie was a disappointment. It was, it was a disaster. That's what it was, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> I, oh, I hated that movie. I was so disappointed. But yeah, I read those books, inhaled them. Yes. I would read them in a few days. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I did not do that. <laughs> okay, well, I was a big reader, so I would yes. lock up in my room and it wouldn't come out for three days. <laughs> yeah, it took me a long time to read those. Uh, yeah, I didn't have a lot of other competing interests mm. when I was younger, I don't think. Uh, that's why I kind of tabered off in high school when you start having, you know, being all of your activities. 
I guess. Yeah. At least in my high school. We're getting way off topic. So off topic. Okay, That's okay. Well, we That's... love dragons. We love that they're based on animals and that they're cool and stuff. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just really quick, going through like some of my favorite moments okay. about a Hiccup and Stoic. All right. Number one. Um, uh, in no particular order. In no particular order. I really love Astrid. I mean, she's a big part of the plot. She's yeah. important to the she connection. She Hiccup. Yeah. Yeah. Like, she's the one who's like, oh, we have to go tell them. Like, she... In those times, like, of seeing the nest and all of those things, she speaks for the Vikings, Mm -hmm. and Hiccup speaks for the dragons, you know? And so she's like, we have to go tell them about the nest. Like, this is what we've been searching for. Um, This is our legacy, basically. And I love that about her. I love that that is, like, she is so enveloped in their culture, and Hiccup is not. Yeah. Well, I feel like that makes her really important. Like, I've, I've always yes, liked her I, role because... I do, yeah. You know, have you ever heard of the idea of, like, the um, you've got the leader and then the, the first follower? Mm, yes! Yeah. So, if it weren't for the... Okay, so for those of you who don't understand what that is, it's uh, there's a concept, like, in leadership and, like, starting movements where if uh, a picture of beach... No, let's use how you just use how to train your dragon because we're talking about it. Okay, yeah. this is the analogy. Hiccup uh, is uh, like this outcast. He's like a sort of like considered crazy, right? And so he goes off and he's, he starts this thing by combining with a dragon, and uh, and he's crazy by doing that by starting this movement. But Astrid is the first follower. She's the first one of the Vikings to join him and say yes to that. Yes. Which allows the other teenagers, because she's cool, and because she does it, you see, oh, there's two people doing that. Maybe it's less crazy. So then the teenagers do it, and then when they all do it, then it's like everybody starts to agree with Mm -hmm. it. So if it's not for that first follower, a movement could never get started. Yeah. Because if a leader does something and starts a movement and nobody follows it, Mm -hmm. it's not a movement. It's just a crazy person, (laughs) you know? So it's like... It's got, it's like her role is really important in, in the Very. whole scheme of things. Like I, I thought that it was, it was well mm. done. I thought maybe, you know, she could have gotten a little bit more developed rather than like yes. so suddenly changing over to Hiccup's side. Maybe right. it's my only complaint, yeah. but I, I thought she was great. Because all it takes is romantic flight. Song title yeah. scene. Um, <laughs> That's true. It's just that. That's like the only thing which. Yeah. You know. But I mean, there's only so much time in film and I think. True. Sometimes people are like, oh, well, she was mean to him before. But, okay, so all the teenagers are, like, apparently, like, pick on Hiccup or whatever. But let me just say that Astrid doesn't actually say that much to Hiccup unless it he is, like, inhibiting something about the culture, like, really directly. Like, she gets really frustrated at him when he isn't taking it seriously. Mm. Because, again, her motivation, her set is... I need, we need to follow this legacy. Mm -hmm. Like, we need to take this war seriously. Seriously, And so she isn't just picking on him to pick on him like like the other kids. She's she's like, dude, you're going to be chief. Get it together. Mm -hmm. Like, this is your war, too. So, yeah, she isn't like the other kids in that way. Like, she only, like, says those mean things when it's like, you need to get your act together. Right, it's directly against, like, her super objective. Yes, Yes, exactly. And then when she does meet Toothless and um, sees that they're different, dragons are different, um, she could have just left and been like, I'm going to tell them anyway. But she stops and, like, believes Hiccup and is like, oh, you're serious. Like, you know, now he's being serious about something, right? Yeah. Hiccup is like, no, I we can't. We have to protect Toothless. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love it. Um, and then, yes, and so when and when it, Toothless is taken away, uh, Astrid is the one who's like, well, what are you going to do about it? Right. I love that conversation yeah, that they have. Yeah, me too. It's so great. And throughout, you know, the second film especially, and I can't wait for the third one. <laughs> Don't blame you. Um, yeah, you, they're just, their relationship is really well-developed and just real. So right. I mean, that's, like, that's the kind of relationship we all want to have. Like, I think that's what's really cool about some of the important relationships between father and son, between mm-hmm. uh, Hiccup and Dragon, between, yeah. um, you know, Hiccup and Astrid. It's like, those are relationships we want to have. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a special one, too. So, going back to Stoic, um, I love watching this film now in the context of the second one okay. about his mother, mm-hmm. about Valka being taken away, and everyone thinks she's dead, blah, blah, blah. Because when Hiccup's in the ring um, with the monster's nightmare, and, you know, he's... 
saying I'm not one of them, et cetera, et cetera. The scene afterwards with Hiccup and Stoic is one of the best scenes, both visually and just like story-wise, because they go into the hall, the great hall, and um, it's like that dark, really Lighting horrible. Once again. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> and um, Stoic is so hard on him, but it's like in his, in Stoic's mind, it's like Hiccup is siding with the dragons, like the dragons killed his wife. Right. Like, how could you, like, you're not my son anymore. Mm-hmm. You, you can't. Yeah. And he doesn't understand. And I love, and I, I said this already, but I love that line of like, they've killed hundreds of us. We've killed thousands of them. Mm-hmm. It's so good. And it's just like, brings it to light. Like, this is more complicated. Like, this is not, we need to stop. We just need to stop. And I love that little moment that Stoic has when he leaves the hall and has to like stop for a second and he has just has that look on his face. Like he's not happy to do this either. Like he wasn't happy to like be that way with his son. And I feel like that just kind of, I feel like that's a glimpse into the way he's parented Hiccup Mm. his whole life of being really, really hard on him. And Stoic doesn't want to do that, but that's the only way he knows how. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he's dealing with so much pain. Yeah. Because... Falca's gone, and, yeah. and he has to suck it up and take care of the village. Yeah. Stoic! What a guy. What a guy. Yeah. And then I love it, love it, love it when they finally get to the island, and the kids do, and um, Hiccup's trying to, you know, get Toothless out of his thing, and um, Stoic does, you know, and, you know, before Hiccup flies off, Stoic, I love, just love that scene of, like, Stoic being like, you know, I'm proud of you, like, you don't, you don't need to do this, and it's like... It's an occupational hazard. <laughs> like, you just hiccup goes, and I love the final battle with the Red Death. And man, okay, okay. I, ooh, <laughs> one more thing. I, so many things. Man, I teared up again <laughs> watching this film. Um, when the dust, like the explosion happened, the dust settles, and Stoic is looking for his son. It rips me apart. <sighs> and, there's that he, long shot yeah. where he's like kind of distant in the frame and you see all the Vikings in the back, right? Yeah. And then I think that's that's when he sees, that's when he finds um, Hiccup, I think. When Toothless, because you see Toothless and yeah. Stoic comes to Toothless and you see like the saddle and all the things is like burned off and, yeah. and it's like, oh no, he's gone. But then, and it's so sad and you see everyone's reactions. It's just like, no. And then... Toothless opens his wings and Hiccup is there. And it's just like, it's just like the, I feel all of the feels. Yeah. And like, I feel that joy because I can so feel that sorrow yeah. of what could have happened. Uh, just that he loses his leg, again, is just so well done. Right. It's a payoff, like we said earlier. Yeah. Oh, and he, you get that last, that, that one shot when they're leaving Hiccup's house, uh, Hiccup and Toothless, and even the way they handle that of him, like, it's still it's still super tender, and, like, he needs t- Toothless's help to walk, mm-hmm. um, and they're leaving, and you see there's that shot of his leg and Toothless's tail. It's so good. Because <laughs> so they are just, like, a part of each other. Yeah. And they are the ones that hurt each other. They literally tore each other apart. Yeah. And it took me... A really long time to actually like look closer at that final like explosion and like realize that Toothless did it because like when Hiccup's falling, Toothless is reaching out for him, and you can see the way to- Toothless saves him is by like grabbing his leg mm-hmm. and pulling him out, pulling him in, you know. Yeah, so he like bites his leg, right? Or yeah. With- is it his mouth or is it his claws? I can't quite remember. It's his mouth. Okay. Because you see him dive and, and his, his mouth, mouth is yeah. there. And so you just get like a brief glimpse yeah, before the fire. Second. Like yeah. either way, like obviously it like impacted me because it was like, you know, I could believe that happened. Um, that his his leg was gone. But it took me a while to be like, oh wait, it was toothless. But it's just like. Yeah, I don't think I realized that until right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was always like, yeah, he, his leg, it came off in the fire in the fire because <laughs> you're like wait how did that happen <laughs> yes okay so everyone who is, is listening needs to rewatch that last that scene slow motion shot or get it find a gif online or something so you can really watch every frame toothless is diving for hiccup right hiccup's leg is up a little you can tell like that's the first thing that toothless is going to be able to reach and toothless 
is going to bite down onto Hiccup's leg and bring him and in. Pull him in and protect him. him. And that's how he does it. So in my mind, Toothless might not have like might not have like completely removed his leg at that point, but they would have to remove his leg. Right, because he had bit onto it and it was probably bleeding, you know, or something like that. It, it's probably it unsalvageable. Broken. Right. Yeah, and they don't show it in that scene, and no. so you don't really. They don't see. Uh, the, yeah, you only know that because Gobber is like. Well, they saved most of him. Right. He saved most of him, and, you know, the leg's gone. But clearly, Gobber is a great example of they have, uh, you know, expertise in how to deal in <laughs> right. with amputees. <laughs> yeah, plenty. And I will say, too, because, again, I'm just, this was really my gateway fandom, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, there's just some really good fan fiction out there about dealing with amputation and, like, ghost limbs and Mm. things like that yeah just how hard that must be yeah it's just crazy you know i heard uh you might know about this i don't know but i I heard that they weren't originally going to have him lose his leg like it wasn't part Mm -hmm. of the plot and they were um they i think it was steven spielberg that they showed it to he was like in the group or something and he was like what if this happens and they're like, that's too far, uh, and they like didn't want to do it. Yeah. So they animated it anyway, <laughs> and then yes. showed a focus group of like parents. Yeah. And it was like overwhelming that the parents were like, that you gotta have that because it 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 like, otherwise he wasn't like injured enough. Like it didn't make sense. Right. It was too. That's what impacted me too. Was like it wasn't that perfect. Everything's fine now. No. Something happened, right. and like there was a consequence, and there was a bad consequence, and that was Hiccup losing this like, Oh, yeah, and I'm so glad they did that. Me too, otherwise, it would not be the same. No, it wouldn't. I mean, they just wouldn't have uh, had the same uh, gravitas that you know something like that would cause. And I think a lot of movies do end up with like, Oh, everything's fine, the hero's perfectly normal now. It's like, No, he's yeah. got a new normal, like, he has to deal with different issues now, right? And that's that's part of the hero's journey, I think. Uh, that is really important to hit on and why it works so well in this in this film because he he has to cope with that and so that's really cool oh my gosh it's so good i'm so glad i mean it's just such a big part of it yeah um also the tv show has a lot of really funny moments about the leg oh yeah about him like (laughs) learning about it um they just they're willing to make fun of it (laughs) Good. More than the movies do, you know, because the movies it's just like you know it's, yeah, he ha- it's it's accepted it's there. There are just a couple times when the he, hiccup just logistically runs into problems because he doesn't have a leg. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that would happen. And it is hilarious yeah. and really really funny. Well, it's like it's uh, I remember um, my wife saying that like we watched this film together. Uh, well, at least part of it. And yeah. she, at the end, she said two two comments. One was, so let's go back a little bit just to get this to mm-hmm. reel into it. So stoic and the end, um, Hiccup having that moment in the middle of the fight where they talk to each other. Yeah. Uh, when he says like, I'm sorry, you don't have to do this or whatever it is mm-hmm. that he says. <laughs> My wife was like, oh, come on. You hated on him the entire movie. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you can't just do that. And, and right. um, it was like, I remember we had to talk about it afterwards to be like, no, like, that is why it works, because Mm -hmm. he changes. And she was like, ah, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) No, so it's just me. Right. Well, have you seen the new clip? (laughs) And the full, the next full trailer will come out on the 25th. I saw the teaser. Yeah, the teaser for that. They do that now. They tease the trailer. Like, uh, yeah. what? It's like one little minute of the trailer. It's like 30 seconds. Yeah, not even. But... I'm excited because we get to see a little bit more in the third film of Stoic. Yeah. You know, actually, I mean, he he does love Hiccup. Yeah, he And does. he cares for him. And he just, up until this first, you know, end of the first one, he just was not a good at parenting. No. No. So not, it'll not. be fun to see that. The other thing that she commented on was how at the very end when uh, Hiccup's, like, leaning on toothless mm-hmm. and he's kind of relying on him to to walk um and then he just hops on top of him and they start flying you like at first you're like he couldn't do that he's like never like he hasn't even walked on this the foot before and now they're flying together and it's a little bit unbelievable but i'm i the more i thought about that the more i was like well what if this was like 
this they transition days or something like mm. maybe it's days later or maybe it is possible i don't have an amputated leg i don't know <laughs> i mean they stretch reality yeah they really there do. are dragons i know <laughs> it's just so funny to like i always end up picking on like one little thing yeah, at the end yeah. of movies it's just a habit i have <laughs> right and like obviously there are moments where i can't suspend my disbelief any yeah. further either and so. when you watch it so many times you start to see those things obviously oh, yeah. the first few times obviously. i'm like Oh, I don't care. It's but then, just of so course, good. I just dismiss all of them anyway because I love it so much. Yeah. So. <laughs> I guess if I was going to say one other thing, it would just be um, the I really love the cinematography of this film. Like, it's not just a good story; it's like a really well crafted film. Uh, because I think one of the special things that I noted about it is like their camera movements. Yeah. Uh, they they do some really interesting camera moves that are based on like real machinery. Mm. Um, so like I know some about making films, and so I know that like certain cranes or jibs move in certain ways and create certain camera movements. Yeah. And so I was paying attention to that this last time and how, huh. you know how um, Toothless like smashes into that cave that the um the training dome and he like breaks into it and yeah. then there's like there's that it's when they the night fury basically first makes their appearance and then they and then they or mm-hmm. in burke and then they they all like swarm him yeah there's this movement where the camera goes up and towards the edge of the like jungle gym looking yeah. thing like the grid and it goes up and then like curves downward and then like reveals what you're you're like looking straight down then yes, so you I move think, up mm-hmm. and through the grid and then down and it's like this super cool movement right that like a real camera can do and i was like oh. it's one of those things that like it's not just the fact that because it's an animated world we can do whatever we want with cameras yeah. like they, they a lot of films do that a lot of animated films but mm-hmm. this one was doing movements that are like real camera movements and that i think is a subtle way of saying like like making it real um i love that it's like the cinematography i think was really excellent um and they'd even go from like uh, it's a a really basic cinematography thing where you're like it's sort of shaky like it Mm. looks like it's a handheld camera yeah Uh, and then because the scene is really intense and then it goes to like it's on a tripod or something you know yeah um I, one of my favorite shots in the whole movie is the one I mentioned earlier where Toothless is lying on the ground holding Hiccup and Stoic is kneeling uh, yeah. and it's just like still and there's it sits on that for like, I don't know, five seconds or something, but it's mm-hmm. long enough and it's just really powerful. So Oh, I love that. I their, love that view of it. Yeah. Their their treatment of the camera and the lighting like we talked about earlier and the the, the lighting and colors the colors the the speed of things and and like how mm-hmm. far away they move like from the action like it's just well crafted from a camera angle too not just like the animation yeah. so oh i love hearing that yeah i love all aspects of this film okay you mentioned <laughs> spielberg and i just need to say this is what Spielberg has to say about How to Train Your Dragon 3, everybody. Insane congratulations. I cannot believe what I just read, and I had a problem reading the last part of it through my tears. It's a complete unqualified classic and better than the original. I've never witnessed this kind of transformation from the last two drafts I read to this one. Um, and I'm just, like, dying inside because Spielberg is basically, like... The best, and um, he's freaking out about this film too. So, <laughs> yeah, he's he's obviously very good. He's got a huge repertoire. So, mm. Mm. that's good. Mm. It's gonna be a good one. It's gonna make me. What's cry. the date on that one again? They've moved it up to February twenty second. Oh, well, it's gonna be early March, but now yeah. it's February twenty second. Twenty second. Okay. Put it on your calendars, everybody. Yes, please do. Um, I will. I haven't decided yet, but I'm thinking I might take that Friday off so that I can see it Thursday, then stay up all night freaking out, and then <laughs> <laughs> see it again on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come. Can I come? Yes, please. Great. I would love it. you to come. I might be in South Africa, actually. Yeah. Then you can't come. Nope. <laughs> all right, we'll see. I know too much about the third one already, but that's just how I do yeah. nowadays. I just know everything. Not everything, but... Um, <laughs> You get really deep know. into the stuff. Yeah, right? I get yeah. deep into all of the conventions and the interviews. And I don't know, from the trailers so far, because we've known for a long time that Dean is making three. That's all he's making. Mm. And I think that's really noble of him. 
because DreamWorks likes to make lots of lots of yeah. sequels. Yes, they do. One small flaw uh, <laughs> of my <laughs> one the wonderfulness that is DreamWorks. He's mentioned in years previous that he wants it to end with the same kind of feel as the books. And he has done a good job, I think, of like at least getting the heart through from the books to the screen, even if the story is very, right. very different. Well, it seems like the author, what's her name? Kim, Kim, uh, Cressida, uh, Cressida Crowell. Yeah, uh, she, she uh, seems to Cressida have... Cressida Cowell. Yeah, Cressida Cowell seems to have approved of everything thus far, it seems yes. like, so that's yes. pretty cool. And the books end very well, but bittersweetly. <laughs> oh! oh. <laughs> I <I've> read them! <laughs> okay. Well, um, I don't want it to end, but I know all good things must come to I close. know. I am... I'm just... And I know, I'm sure there will be a franchise that will impact me very deeply again. Mm, it but it's also hard because I've grown up with this mm. franchise and these characters and, you know, there's always something else to look forward to and I'm going to be really sad when it's over. And obviously, again, there's always other things to be excited about. But like I said, like I've explained, this, these, the, these films have a really special place in my heart and I'm going to be really, really sad to let them go. Yeah. Well, it's it's like with anything, any piece of art that you make, uh, you you have to let that happen and let it move on and release it so you can move to the next thing. And it yeah. doesn't mean that your connection to it, you know, with all the stuff that we talked about earlier, of, you know, your hopes and dreams, that those are not going to end because the movie ends. That's <laughs> so. true. And then you, we always get to look forward to see what Dean is doing next. That's right. Whatever that ends up being. Whatever that is. Great. So. What have you been watching recently? What have I been watching recently? Uh, Hilda. Yes! <laughs> Hilda on Netflix is my dear show. Is this how we're going to wrap the show? The wrap the podcast? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, Hilda is what I've been watching. Um, I loved that show. I don't normally binge watch anything, uh, but I binge watched that. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, like... Not only adorable and just well, like, drawn and animated and Mm -hmm. pretty. And, like, I loved, like, for example, the outlines of all of the characters. Yes. Right? They're They're, little fuzzy. Yeah. They look like little crayons. Like, they drew it with a crayon. And so you see, like, the brokenness of that. It just looks like it's drawn. I just love that. I don't know why. It's so Yeah, the style is beautiful. So I loved that. Um, But not only that, but the way that they move, the way that the story gets told, the way that these characters unfold um and i think i told you this uh, before but I, my, one of my favorite things about the whole series is how uh, each of the characters that get introduced they all slowly get introduced to the magic of the world as well mm. like it's not just uh you know it starts off with hilda and the the like the the troll that she finds um, and there's all these like mythical things in the woods and at first you're like this all might be in her head <laughs> like she might just be imagining everything yeah. but then as things start to progress other people and other characters start to like also acknowledge these things yes. and you're like oh like they're learning about it just like I'm learning about it and mm-hmm. there's oh that's just so welcoming and inviting it's not like a secret anymore yes. and I'm just I'm so happy to see a, a show that an animated show that they're not treating it like a secret. Like, I love Troll Hunters. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I love yeah. Troll Hunters. But it was, like, the whole time, it's like, it's a secret. Don't tell anyone in the world. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And And uh, now, and Hilda was not like that. Yes. I just really w- thought that was refreshing. It's such a breath of fresh air, this show. I highly recommend it. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw Smallfoot in theaters. Oh. I really enjoyed it. I was really entertained. Okay. The entire show. And I love going to theaters because it's with a lot of other people there and you get to hear other people's reactions. And um, there were these kids that were honestly the best because, <laughs> <laughs> because they just s- giggled at everything. Oh, and, fun. you know, body humor, visual gags aren't necessarily super funny to me all the time. And But, you know, that's they loved it. Yeah. <laughs> they, and I was just so happy to be there listening to them love it. Oh, yes. <sighs> anyway, and the the soundtrack is gorgeous. Okay. Uh, they have a whole bunch of really great singers and just a good film. Just mm. a, uh, probably not my favorite, but like really well done. Solid. 
reminded me a little bit of how to train dragon, but that's because I <laughs> everything does. <laughs> everything does, yeah. <laughs> but it's really, really great in its own right, okay. and um, super fun. So yeah, yeah. all right. Thank you so much for tackling this film with me. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. I'm honored to be in such something so important to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And I hope I have touched on everything, but we will definitely be talking about the second film sometime before the third one comes out. Okay. Um, and we'll be able to talk more about Hiccup and Toothless and Astrid mm. and... Roughnut and Tufnut and Snotlout. Yeah, we didn't even get <laughs> didn't to Roughnut, Tufnut, and Snotlout and their and, um, and fish, legs fish legs and... Oh, they're yeah, great too. Oh my goodness, they're, they're great too. They are so good. Such oh, fun characters. Such good char- yeah, some good characters. Oh yeah. man, wow, we didn't even get there. <laughs> Do you have anything you wanted to mention? Nah, that nah, it's too much. <laughs> too much. We'll save it for another time. Uh, we'll save it. All right. Well, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Josh. Bye. Bye bye. Yay. <laughs> much for listening. Let us know your thoughts on How to Train Your Dragon or any of your other favorite animated media on Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at Fanimated Podcast. You can also email us at fanimatedpodcast at gmail.com. The art for this podcast is done by me, Kelly Anderson. You can find me on Tumblr and Instagram at kelbell312. The music is provided by the folks at Purple Planet, and a huge thank you to Josh Palmer for discussing my favorite film with me and for the very fun original song he wrote just for the podcast. You can find Josh making films throughout the Twin Cities, so be sure to check out his production company, Drawbridge Collective, at drawbridgecollective.com. Thanks again for listening, and if you want to support this show further, consider leaving us a rating and review. It really helps new people find the show. And be sure to subscribe. We have some exciting new things cooking behind the scenes, and you won't want to miss our Halloween episode next week. So stay tuned and stay animated.